Thank you for the kind introduction. I hope uh, things will work okay. So I will uh, go on and try to uh, provide some theory to the recent uh, experiments that you just heard about by Frick Massé, a colleague of mine. So, I mean, in order to motivate uh, uh, that talk, uh, I mean, you may worry about why studying magnetic impurity in superconductors, it's a purely whole problem, solved one. I mean, typically what I have in mind, let's consider uh, iron, cobalt, manganese atom inside a S-wave superconductor. So what do we know about it? I mean, this problem has been solved a long time ago in the, 50, in the 60s, and we expect bound states. And it turns out that, well, this problem is well known and solved, but uh, it regains some uh, interest. Essentially, be, it was motivated by the, the perspective of uh, Magdalena bound states uh, using chains of uh, magnetic adductors on top of the superconductors. So there was a series of experiments uh, by the Princeton group, Berlin, Basel, and uh, more recent one by the Humboldt groups, uh, where they consider iron chains or wires on top of a superconductor and at the extremities of the chain, some Majorana bound states uh, uh, or evidence or signature of Majorana bound states as zero bias peaks uh, were shown. Uh, so obviously, this raised a lot of interest in the community. And uh, this push uh, uh, us to maybe have a better understanding of already the basic uh, cornerstone of this proposal, the single impurity. So this is the outline of my talk. Uh, I will try to convince you that, uh, for, follow up the, the talk by Frick Massé, that we can get some insights of a, about transport properties uh, inside these Shiba bond states. And, uh, in, a, in the last few slides, I will show you that actually this uh, short noise tomography can be an interesting signature uh, to look for major bound states. So let's start with the short noise tomography. So the, as I said, the system of interest is a single magnetic impurity uh, inside a superconductor. So without the impurity, well, uh, this is the typical spectral feature with a nice gap. When we add a magnetic impurity, which is exchange coupled to the substrate, so here I'm it basically I will model the impurity as a classical magnetic field and eventually some uh, non magnetic scattering. This gives rise to these bond states, which are generically asymmetric inside the gap, this green uh, uh, arrow here. The position of these uh, Shiba bond states are a function of J, the magnetic coupling, and the non-magnetic one. Um, well, if you this is a if you consider, for example, a 2D Andervas magnetic supercon superconductor like now BMD selenites, which contains a, a small number of magnetic impurities, iron, chrome, and manganese. This is typically what uh, you will show. Uh, so it turns out that these magnetic bond states have a very large extent, about 20 nanometers. And indeed, uh, in the spectra, you see these small peaks here around zero energy. Um, this, I mean, there are more uh, in the past uh, five, six years, there have been much more evidences and, uh, of the long range extents of these magnetic bond states. Uh, you just show, uh, Frick just presented this uh, uh, these bond states with a very high resolution. There were some orders in the Ambo group in Lantanium 001 and also in the Katarinas Franke group. So, as you see, I mean, in these 2D superconductors, bond states have a very large extent and we have very good energy resolution of them. So, we can get a very good understanding of the real space form of these Yushiba resin of states, their anisotropy. Uh, eventually the decay and all the oscillating part, which can be understood by the anisotropy of the Fermi surface. So recently we have developed a magnetical approach, uh, which enabled to uh, get the uh, uh, hand on the shape and all that features. But today I would like to feature, to, to focus better on the transport properties. Uh, 
typically when you want to pop such bond states, uh, you, most experienced consider superconducting deep, which has high resolution uh, in energy, and try to inject electrons. So there are two processes which are uh, typically uh, involved, either inelastic uh, process where you send electrons, it go into the bound states and move away. So, or you also have elastic process in which you inject uh, an electron, for example, in the electronic part of the bound states, and you, you are under the reflected, get the old back, and you transfer a charge 2E into the substrate. This is typically, uh, these two processes have been uh, evidenced in, uh, recently in this paper in the group of Katharina Franker, where when the tip is far away from the ad atoms, well, we, we are mainly uh, dominated by the inelastic processes. Why? If you bring your tip much, much closer, you see that uh, actually uh, Andre F processes start to pop in and you have a different scaling behavior of the conductance as a, as a function of the normal conductance. Okay, uh, with, uh, with uh, our experimental colleague, uh, Fred Massey and Mar Marco Aprili, uh, well, we try to better understand if we can get more insight from the current noise. So current noise, well, yeah, you still have your STM tip, but what you want to measure is actually the current current correlation functions at very low uh, frequency and therefore uh, you would have access some, to some kind of atomically resolved final factor which is the ratio between the noise divided by the current. So Frick already told you about that. Um, again the idea is to have uh, uh, to discriminate between all these processes elastic processes and inelastic processes. For elastic processes like Andre F1, like where you inject an electron and get a all back, you expect a final factor equal one, but a charge transfer to E, as I mentioned. So therefore an effective final factor, which is the ratio between the short noise divided by two E to be equal to two. On the other hand, when you have inelastic processes, uh, which is uh, Poissonian or below Poissonian, uh, you are blocked somewhere, so you expect a final factor to be less than one. So when both processes are taken into account, you do expect a final factor between, well, I don't know, less than one and, and two. So let's see uh, what we get. So this is the, the, the experimental data that Frick mentioned. Top of it, you have uh, the DIDV. You see two uh, Shiba peaks, and right below, this is the effective final factor. When the peak is small, you, you typically have a final factor which is much larger than one, between around 1.2. However, for the largest peak, you get a final factor which is less than one. Uh, is it an artifact? In fact, not. For example. For this, if you move away, you keep uh, uh, far, uh, still uh, in, in the Shiba bond state where functions. Here you have a large peak in the old sector and small peak in the electronic sector. And this gives right to an effective final factor less than one where you have the large peak and a final factor more than one where you have a small peak. And it turns out that this behavior is quite uh, generic. And here you can use the fact that the Shiba bond states have a long extent and because the electronic and all part uh, oscillate when you move along the when you explore the whole extent of these bond states you, you can require many many uh, data at atomic resolutions and this is typically uh, what is shown here the rule of the thumb a large peak in the DIDV will give you a final factor less than one. So this is what is shown here in red. So, however, a small peak in the, in the DIDV will give you a large final factor above than one. And you have a systematic such behavior that you can collect here. Okay, so I'm a theorist, okay, how can I understand that? 
So we made a few uh, theoretical basic assumptions. First, we want we will assume that the data are taken away from the core of the magnetic impurity. So we will only retain the the one state contributions uh, to the transport observable. So rail inside the gap. I will neglect any invasive effect between tip and bonds and uh, the impurity. And I expect, uh, uh, well, this, uh, this feature to be enough, uh, relevant enough to describe uh, the experiments. So uh, what about the model? We consider a very simple model, a classical mag magnetic field, and eventually some scalar potential. This gives you two parameters, two dimensional parameters. So we are left with a total of four parameters, basically. The energy of the Shiba bond states is zero here. And this part of U and V, which can be related to the electronic and all part of the wave functions, which are also related to the magnetic and non-magnetic part of the interactions. And the temperature is, an extra is obviously relevant. And the fourth parameter is, I call it lambda, or tau, which is the inverse of the lambda, which is the intrinsic lifetime of the Shiba bond states. It turns out that, well, within this simple resonant model, we can calculate both the current and the noise. And more than that, OK, the expression look uh, ugly and lengthy, however, uh, we can really look at term by term. The first line that I'm showing here with this green row corresponds to the Andreev line contributions, which is particularly symmetric. The next two lines corresponds to quasi particle contribution, which is inelastic. These are the, my two main channels. And finally, the last two lines correspond to thermal contributions, which goes to zero when temperature moves to zero. And we can have some, uh, have some dia specific diagram to each of these terms. Uh, if I will make a, a few assumptions, uh, let's this expression simplify when the position of the bond states is larger than KBT, which is larger than the than gamma, which is the, the tip aggregation scale. And uh, basically, from this expression, we can extract all parameters, but one. The position of the peak is given by the experiments. The temperature, which is around 700 millik, is given by the experiments. And this gamma, so the hybridizations, and it can be extracted from the normal conductance. And using the anisotropy between the electron and all peaks, we can extract the u squared and the v squared. So basically, we are left for a given impurity with only a single parameter, lambda, which we can extract. And as for to show you, uh, we use this uh, intrinsic uh, Shiba bound state lifetime as a fit. And uh, it works just quite pretty well, the data, assuming uh, intrinsic lifetime of the other one and second, which correspond to an energy scale of one micro EV. Uh, well, in short, we have a pretty good understanding uh, of the experimental data using this simple model. And this predicts, therefore, lifetime, which is pretty short, uh, around one of the other one and the second at 700 millik. So in the next few minutes, uh, I would like to push this idea a bit forward and to see whether we can use this short noise tomography as a signature of Majorana bond states. I don't need to introduce further the Majorana bond states. I mean, it was already mentioned in a few talks, especially yesterday. Uh, on the theory part, I mean, um, sorry. I would like to I mean, mention that in the earlier theory paper, people look at the current and the noise in a 2 lead device with Majorana bond states. What is the prediction concerning current? If you try to pump this minor bond state, you do expect a perfect zero bias peak. With a, so at conductance 2 square of h. 
But also, you ex do expect the final factor equal to one. Why is it so? A Majorana bound state is characterized by a perfect electron hole symmetry. Therefore, you're perfectly all Andreev reflected. You send an electron, you get the hole back, priority one. So, therefore, if we are probing these Majorana wave functions, we do expect a perfect final factors, whatever the position of the tip, providing it probes the, the, the bound states. So we have considered several situations uh, to, in order to discriminate Majorana bond state from fake Majoranas, which could be, for example, the Shiba bond state at zero energy, an Andreev bond state at zero energy, or quasi Majorana. So all, in all the situations that we've been considering so far, they will be characterized in the conductance by zero bias peak. So I want to see whether noise is able to discriminate, to sort the zero bias peaks. So I'll make a few assumptions. I will assume that I'm considering a voltage less than the effective gap and larger than temperature. And typically, well, I will assume that equalizations is larger than the intrinsic lifetime. So what we found uh, at, in the limit where the EV of voltage is larger than hybridizations, is that the final factor, which is specially dependent now, its atomic resolutions, can be expressed in a very simple manner. It's one plus a term, which is just a local BCS charge. And uh, so, or in, in other words, the particle all asymmetry. And it exactly concerns for my band state. So we do expect the final factor to be one, whatever the position for the Meyer band states. So we probe that, and you can one, there will be correction at larger, but it's which are small. So we probe that, and this is about in different uh, situations. So this slide is a bit complicated, but it summarizes the key results. As I say, in all the situations I'm considering, they're all which uh, we could. The Majorana in red and the other bond states are in blue, they are all characterized by zero bias peak. What is depicted here is the noise. So for the Majorana in red, when you move your tip away from the core of the, the, the Majorana bond states, you find a final factor which is one, whatever the position. However, if you compare to Yushiba Rosinov bond states, still at zero energy, you found oscillations of the, your final factor between one and two. We did the same for Andreev bond states. The Majorana is one, and Andreev bond states show oscillation again far away. And these oscillations are due to the fact that uh, when you move away, uh, when you probe uh, far away from the Andreev bond state, you do uh, see particle all oscillations, in, which are intrinsic uh, to the Fermi C. Uh, the situation of what we call a quasi Majorana bond states, which may occur when you have a, a normal metal smoothly contacting to a S-wave superconductor, then you, your bond states have some large uh, extent. Uh, you find that your final factor for the Majorana is one as it should be. However, for this quasi Majorana from bond states, it's one in the normal part and we start only to oscillate in the superconducting part. Still, okay. it does oscillate. You have two minutes uh, left. Then, you have two minutes. Yeah, I'm done almost. Yeah. Perfect, perfect. That's my last slide. Uh, first, this situation of quasi major bound state demands fine tuning, so it's not generic. Uh, and although uh, it starts to mimic the, the situation of major bound state, we do see if you move away some oscillations. And my last statement would be okay, a quasi minor bound state, after all, is a Majorana, which is not protected, and something that can be useful. I try to convince you actually that this uh, short noise tomography, which explores the non locality of the Majorana function, turns out to be a very good tool in order to discriminate Majorana bond state from other fake bond states. And uh, this brings me to my conclusions. So I show you the use of, of short noise in the sh for Shiba bond states, and we have a pretty good understanding of the experimental data performed shown by Frick Messe, and uh, a theory proposal, use final factor to, as a signature of minor bond states. 
and this could be a necessary ingredient, maybe not a foolproof, uh, and could be an interesting tool to develop. For free. And to finish, uh, let me thank my main collaborators, especially Vivian Perrin, PhD student, uh, and Mathieu Civelli, and my experimental colleague, uh, Frick Massé, Marco Aprili, uh, Tupacula, and uh, Alassi, Andre Alessandra Palacio Morales. Thank you for your attention. I um, can take a few questions. Thank you for this very interesting talk. So, other questions? Not from the audience here. What about from online? There's one question from the audience. No? No. Okay. Well, <laughs> there seems to be no question. <laughs> but um, so then I think we thank the speaker again and go on to the next talk.